So today we have a couple of speakers, some new, and we'll start off with Keith Mersch from uh, the Canadian Animal Health Surveillance System to give us an update on what CAS is yeah. working on. Thank you, Christy. Um, most of the activities with the uh, CAS, Canadian Animal Health Surveillance System, <clears throat> over the past month have been uh, revolving around um, preparation of documents uh, and, and having meetings uh, to uh, move forward, uh, talks on having the coordination activity um, moved out of CFIA and to the National Firm to Animal Health and Welfare Council. Um, uh, things like we certainly had a director's meeting to discuss that and preparation of uh, financial reports. Uh, and also, we did surveys of priorities for the different network groups, and inc including the equine one. And um, also, a resolution document that was sent out to owning members uh, to see if uh, they agree with um, CAS and National Farm the Animal Health and Welfare Council starting discussions with that. Uh, so the details are, are yet to be determined. So they're just starting discussions with respect to that. There's been also some activity on case definitions. Uh, uh, a lot of the activities of the groups have slowed down this past month because of uh, you know their volunteers and uh, there's a lot of equine activities going on in the country at this point in time. So normally in the summertime it's a bit slower for the, the equine network group. That's my update. Thank you, Christine. Great. Thanks, Keith. Um, and I think your update covered what Cheryl was going to cover. Um, so I'm going to just update on what the EC Health and Welfare Committee has been working on on behalf of our co-chair, Melanie Barham. Um, so Health and Welfare Committee met in person at the EC Annual Convention. We have three new rules that will be put out for comment in the next cycle for rules, and these include um, requirement for horses stabled at sanctioned events to be vaccinated against equine herpes virus and equine influenza within six months, um, a requirement for sanctioned shows to have a written agreement with a veterinarian to provide emergency services to the show. Uh, this is clarification on a current rule that's already standing. Um, as well as sanctioned shows would be required to have a written biosecurity plan. This clarification on the current requirement that sanctioned shows have an emergency action plan. The EAP technically does include a biosecurity plan. However, since it's such a large area of concern, given the outbreaks with H, uh, EHV1 in the U.S., clarification was needed. As training is now provided, the barrier to completion on this is lower than previously. Um, Biosecurity training for veterinarians and event operators and facility operators, uh, as well as horse owners, was delivered via free webinar on April 14th and 15th. Dr. Ashley Whitehead and Jin Yin Tan, both internal medicine specialists at the University of uh, Calgary, provided these webinars. The webinars are now posted publicly on the ECE website, and the training can be taken anytime. We heard feedback afterwards, but would be welcomed for additional feedback. Some facilities will be making this training a part of their onboarding package for new staff as a training fee and readily accessible. We are also organizing similar free training via webinar for emergency action, action plan training for both events and facility operators, as well as um, veterinarians in similar fashion to the biosecurity webinars. Um, the committee has discussed the issue of noseband tightness on welfare and performance. We've reviewed the science available and had a discussion with Dr. Curly, Hillary Clayton at the committee meeting at convention. Um, we are working together with the stewards committee on this matter to find a solution that is fair, reliable, repeatable to measure uh, noseband tightness. It is, it is clear that the science summarizes that too tight nosebands uh, create poor welfare and physiological issues for horses. We are committed to finding a solution for this for the sake of our horses. Um, the committee has been working on the equine ID with the working group, um, with many members being a part of the equine ID working group as well as the Health and Welfare Committee. If there are any people listening who would like to be involved, please contact Christy House. Uh, my email address is khouse at equestrian.ca. Um, we are submitting initial paperwork to review for the Equine Code of Practice, which documents uh, the minimum standards for equine care in Canada. And finally, uh, congratulations to our committee member, Dr. Mary Bell, who won the Horse and Welfare Award at convention.
Um, so we're just going to hold off on questions till the end because this call is recorded and we uh, tend to edit out the questions at the end what, before putting on the website because not all participants would like to have um, their questions posted. So if we could just hold off on questions to the end and then I'll open up the line. Um, so next on our update, we have Dr. Allison Moore from the Ontario Animal Health Network. Can you hear me? I was on mute. Yep, I can hear you now. Hi, everyone. So we just held our um, Ontario Animal Health Network equine network calls for Q1, so January, uh, February, and March of this year. It was a pretty quiet uh, quarter overall. We had, in terms of infectious disease, we just had one case of uh, EHV1 abortion on a small farm. Um, in terms of other things that people had been seeing, I think one of the m more notable issues was just a, an increase in the number of uh, broodmare uh, foaling issues that were coming into referral practices. So we had a, a variety of different conditions in the uh, pre- and postpartum mares, such as uh, peritonitis, secondary to uterine ruptures, um, hemoabdomen or blood in the abdomen. Uh, uterine artery ruptures and prepubic tendon ruptures, and then the assortment of foals uh, with septicemia and uh, and diarrhea is starting to be noticed on the increase. However, we haven't been able to identify um, any etiologic agents with the diarrhea at this point. Um, in terms of the full diarrhea, it wasn't noted to be much different than uh, other years. I think also on a uh, an in interesting note, there was or they have been a number of submandibular abscesses due to actinomyces. So these look a bit like strangles, but the horses uh, don't have a fever and they're eating well. Um, but they do develop these uh, enlarged uh, submandibular lymph nodes or lymph nodes under their jaw, and they abscess just just the same as strangles. But the uh, agent is called actinomyces. And this uh, bacteria is in the normal oral mucosa of the horse. And they think uh, either dental issues or rough hay, stemmy hay, um, can cause the uh, bacteria to gain access into the lymph, the lymph um, system and into the nodes. So it was just something that was interesting that we had more reported than normal. And other than that, uh, it's been pretty quiet. So that report, we'll have an owner's report based on that uh, Q1 coming out in the next few weeks. Okay, great. Thank you, Allison. Um, and next we have Claudia Gagné-Fortin from Rezo, Quebec. Hi. Uh, we also had our uh, Equine Network uh, conference call on, at the end of March. Um, so some few cases of interest. Uh, we had uh, an encephalomyelitis due to uh, protozoa, which is pretty uh, rare in Quebec. Uh, and uh, most of the time those cases are from animals that have traveled to U.S. But this time it was not an animal that uh, acquired the, the disease in the U.S. Um, so it was a, an eight months old, uh, old horse, uh, which was near the U.S. border, but um, she was uh, uh, bring to the veterinary hospital and, uh, be because of laying down and because of decrease of comfort and no improvement of the paralysis, uh, she had to be euthanized. But the necropsy had confirmed the diagnosis of uh, protozoa, uh, which involve uh, most of the time uh, uh, um, uh, the cycle of this uh, pathogen needs to uh, go through opossum, and those animals that were used to, to be seen more on the U.S. side uh, start to grow, go up in Canada, and we've seen it in Quebec in the past year. So uh, that's a disease that will we will need to um, to be uh, to watch for it because uh, it may be more uh, frequent in the next years. Uh, we also had a case of equine herpes virus one uh, in a stable. Three horses were um, were implied uh, uh, affected, 
and um, but they all recovered and uh, the um, the stable was uh, uh, applied a voluntary isolation for four weeks uh, so it, it didn't it didn't go uh, in another uh, stable and we also had in December uh, a case uh, sorry in November a case of uh, equine infectious anemia uh, and uh, all uh, the, the the stable has been placed under quarantine by CFIA, and all the tests performed in January were negative, so the quarantine has been released. Uh, so that's what's going on on disease, uh, and uh, also uh, maybe related with. Um, what has been said previously, uh, we also circulated a document on biosecurity for shows and events uh, for horses. So it's in French, but maybe we can send the um, the, the the web link to uh, Christy to share with the group. So that's it for me. Thank you very much, Claudia. And I think yeah, we'd really like to see that. Um, so the final update we have today is for myself. I just wanted to get some awareness around um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has released the proposed National Equine Infectious Anemia Disease Control Program for external consultation. Um, so we're recommending that everyone review the document and send in their comments directly to the CFIA. We are working today on having the PDF document put on our website as well as the link to the consultation. Um, but if anybody wanted it right away, just feel free to email me. I have it and I'll send it over. And you can find it on the uh, inspection.gc.ca website under About CFIA Accountability and Consultation. Um, unless there's anything else that anyone wanted to provide an update on, if Bill, do you have anything you'd like to add to the conversation? Uh, this is Bill. I have some questions. Uh, Christy, did you want me to just briefly talk about the uh, CWHBA conversation? This is Doug. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll apologize to everybody on the call because uh, Melanie was un unable to make our uh, Health and Welfare Committee meeting yesterday. I'm, I'm the other co-chair, but... Uh, I'm a horseman, I'm not a DVM, so I apologize. Uh, we had a very interesting communication from the Canadian Warm Blood Horse Breeders Association um, uh, a, few, a, a few days ago, and then uh, they joined our call uh, yesterday or the day before, I guess it was, uh, just mostly to bring us up to date on uh, a concern they had and to get some information from uh, some of the, uh, the DVMs uh, who sit on our committee. And I suspect a number of people on this call are aware of this, but just to bring you up to date, that the president of the Canadian Warm Blood Horse Breeders Association contacted us uh, with regard to a concern they are having about uh, increased prevalence of um, fragile full, full syndrome uh, in, in warm bloods. And uh, they are beginning to do some uh, uh, cursory investigation of their breeding herds and, um, and, and some uh, DNA testing. Uh, apparently, the only lab currently uh, who uh, can conduct this this testing uh, is in uh, in Florida, and we can send that information out. Christy can make that information available to everybody. They contacted us uh, not so much to um, get a particular response, but just to a keep us in the loop and see if our team uh, had any recommendations. Uh, Dr. Wayne Burwash, who some of you may know. Uh, provided some information about similar genetic disorders that uh, uh, the quarter horse industry has dealt with over the time and the kind of tracking they've done, uh, particularly with, with regard to breeding stallions. Uh, so we had a fairly good conversation uh, just regarding the fact that the uh, CWHBA is beginning to recognize this. Um, at, at this moment, according to them, the incidents are relatively low, uh, but they are concerned about uh, DNA tracking and uh, trying to head this off uh, as, uh, as uh, expeditiously as possible. Uh, they've been in contact with the, uh, the Western College, a uh, couple of folks there, and are uh, at this point just trying to collect more data about prevalence of this and hopefully begin to identify some breeding lines and then begin to, uh, within themselves, impose some, uh, some controls, uh, breeding controls uh, through their uh, registry. Uh, the issue that, of course, just to share with everybody, is that as you know, the CWHBA 
um, actually recognizes stallions from a number of stud books, uh, both in North America and also in Europe. And so um, their, their next priority is to begin identifying uh, in, in coordination with these other studs, uh, stud books, uh, possible incidents of this and beginning to track some genetic lines. Is there anything else, Christy, we need to add at this point? Uh, no, I think that pretty much covers it, so we can open up the floor to questions. Bill, did you want to start? Yeah, I, uh, to, I'll, I'll go first with Doug's point. Uh, the genetic disorder is officially named in the world as the worm blood fragile foal syndrome type 1. That's correct. Or WFFS. And uh, we have had some reports on it. It was first recognized from a five-year-old Westphalian warm blood mare in March 2012. There was diagnosis in 2013, official diagnosis, I guess I should say. Yeah, I can forward this document to everybody, Bill. You're actually just reading the document that I've got in front of me. So uh, absolutely, uh, your information is correct. And I'll, uh, and, but I'll... It, it addresses a bigger problem, and that is responsible breeding, which is addressed in number seven. Uh, of the uh, equine code of practice. And um, the, the, we're seeing a trend in the horse business, and like Doug, I am a horse person. I'm not a veterinary doctor, and I'm, I'm not a technical or scientific person of any kind. And, uh, but we are seeing much more uh, results of uh, mismanaged breeding, misunderstood breeding, and we're seeing more genetic orders similar to SIDS and, and hype, hyper, uh, hyper uh, periodic paralysis, hyperglemic per periodic paralysis in the quarter horse and SIDS in the, in the, in the Arab horses. And so um, I think it's a point that we need to take under consideration and, and uh, follow up on. I think there's more to come. I'll go now, if I may, to Keith Merch. Uh, Keith, is there any reason to believe that we are uh, uh, we are going to have a problem with regulations and regulatory control uh, recognizing that CFIA creates regulations and 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 uh, deals with them but uh, that will not be a role of CAHSS all of, all that is being transferred we are not going to lose any uh, are we going to lose any uh, regulation uh, strength, regulatory strength? Um, I would say that I'm probably not the person to answer that question, but um, I would doubt very much that you lose any regular regulatory strength, uh, Bill, <coughs> on that. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, another little point, too. Christy had mentioned the proposed new EIA regulations. Um, they're also published <coughs> on the public side of the CAS website for anybody who wants access to them as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, and a question to Christy on EIA. Um, you mentioned a number of tests that will be required at commingling sites. Uh, is EIA among those tests? Um, it's definitely something that we have discussed at the Health and Welfare Committee and that we're going to continue to discuss of what that would look for. Um, but sort of what we've tossed around at the committee level is that the prevalence problem doesn't seem to be in um, the show horse populations, and they are currently the horses that are tested the most. Um, it's more on the outskirts. So yep. there is lots of um, recommendation from stakeholders for testing, and I think it's a lot of things that owners do on their own, but that would, I think that would come down to, at this point, a being a requirement of the competition um, hold, holders before it would be a requirement of EC, um, just because of the prevalence not being in the show horse population, and they are continually tested. Thank you. Uh, back to genetic disorders, to a question to Alison Moore. Uh, in your testing that you spoke of, and, and that's a very good project, uh, is, there any, uh, is there anybody looking for genetic disorders or the reasons for some foaling problems? Would they be genetic? Uh, is there any sign of other genetic 
uh, uh, irregularities. Allison. Uh, I would say at this point, in, in terms of what we were seeing this quarter, nothing that would have struck out as being genetic per se. I think um, climate comes into play for a lot of our foaling mishaps, although I think there needs to be a lot more research. But just from um, more ac anecdotal, we, when we have certain types of winter weather, we tend to have certain types of foaling problems. Um, so it may be a, more of an immune thing, immune-related uh, issue as opposed to genetic. But even saying that, I think um, as we start to look at numbers, and it's not something o OMAFRA does in particular, but industry should be supported in looking at um, within their own breed what their um, you know, foaling rate is. And when they start looking at data, I think, and I'm just thinking of some breeds around here, um, it, particularly in racing, where they see that the actual number of mares bred versus number foals that hit the ground is poor, looking at reasons behind that. And then they might come up with some genetic reasons for it. But not, we are not looking at anything specifically, and I can't attribute what we saw in, in the first quarter to any genetic-related disease. Um, thank you very much, Allison. Uh, for the benefit of those here, uh, HWAC will be doing a series of uh, um, uh, articles that talk about breeding and breeders' responsibilities. And we have contracted a person uh, to do this, and they will be available on our website and available for distribution to anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for your time, everybody, for me. Okay, that's Thanks, great. Bill. Thank Thanks, you, Bill. Bill. Uh, is there anybody else who had any questions for any of our speakers today? It's, it's Allison. I just had a um, well a comment and a question for Claudia. So on the equine protozoa myelitis that you you diagnosed or was diagnosed in the eight month old, um, yep. we we have EPM is what we would consider endemic in Ontario. Um, okay. So. It may not be from the U.S. It may be coming eastward. <laughs> not, not trying to blame the province, but just so you know. And I and I think it's also something interesting looking at. I, I don't know if anyone's focusing on the migration of possums and where they head and and how uh, climate environment affects that, but um, or even just the travel of horses back and forth too. Um, but we do see it routinely in the province. Just to, just to let yeah. you know. Uh, uh, we and we asked the question to our uh, wildlife ministry in Quebec, mm -hmm. and they confirmed us that the the I don't know the word in English, but the the area where the opossum are living mm -hmm. uh, is uh, changing, and it uh, since 2015 it started to go really uh, more uh, north. North. So. Um, uh, that's why we can see more in Quebec, but maybe you in, in Ontario, you, you have a, a really southern part of your province than yeah. our province, so that's maybe why we just start to see that. Right, it could be, for sure. It's interesting. And, and with your EIA case, um, was that horse, had that horse been in the province for a while, or had it traveled, do you know? No, there was no history of travel before, okay. uh, no clinical sign, uh, and I don't think that, that there was any uh, sources of infection that was identified. So, And that was pretty the same thing with our uh, previous case in uh, January last year. Uh, we didn't, it was a horse that was, uh, if I'm correct, uh, that was born in Quebec at the, at the, and that as uh, mostly not travel, so th huh. it, those cases are really, um, uh, it, it, it leads to a lot of questions. Right. Okay. Well, thanks. A little scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is Bill DeBarre. Can I have a second comment here? I have, uh, uh, with respect to the EIA in Quebec and the misty, mystery surrounding its where it came from and is going to, this is something that some of us have been concerned about for a number of years. Um, it does rear its ugly, ugly head uh, without warning from anywhere and makes the point, I believe, 
and some of us at HWAC have discussed it, that we do need um, more intense testing. We need to overcome the problem with the horse people, that it, it, it costs too much money, et cetera. We need to talk to the labs, to uh, veterinary medical uh, practitioners about how can we uh, uh, make some plans to congregate a bunch of horses, 10 or 20 or 50 horses together, so that we can cut the costs of testing and, and do some things that can help us uh, maintain control over this EIA before it goes to blazes and causes us much bigger problems, which I am afraid of. Yes. <clears throat> The end. <laughs> Thanks, <Beth. laughs> My rant is done. <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> I I have a comment or question about EPM or equine prozole myelitis. Uh, um, I have suspicions that it can be spread in possum feces contaminated feed. Mm -hmm. um, no. I, I have seen it in the Maritimes, and we have no possums other than maybe the odd hitchhiker. So <clears throat> a little suspicious of that, but it'd be hard to prove. <clears throat> well, I, and I I totally agree with that, Keith. Uh, that that's one of the ways they believe it to be transmitted. Um, and and going to Bill's point on genetics, I and mean, there are I I believe some genetic predispositional. Again, I, they haven't identified genes about it, but standard breds are a a genetically susceptible breed, it would seem, and that's been commented on in some research papers as well. Um, so there is there's that interplay too. But I you know we don't see a lot of opossums around Ontario. You see the odd one on the road that's been hit, or the odd one in a barn, but you know. If, Compared to the number of raccoons we encounter, they're not they're not frequent in my whole horse life. I've seen two, um, but we do we we get a lot that are diagnosed. And when I say diagnosed, I mean you know properly diagnosed through CSF um, and not just antibody levels. But we know through antibody levels, there's been a number of horses exposed to it as well. So it's it's an interesting, although frustrating problem, but. I do think genes play a role in, in how uh, certain breeds um, are more susceptible to it than others, it would seem. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else who has any questions? Okay. With that, I think we'll wrap up for today. Um, and if you have any further questions, feel free to email me at khouse at equestrian.ca. Or if your industry or um, organization has anything, any updates they would like to provide, please email me and we can arrange for you to be on future calls. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Have a great day.